I have a very short period of time to cover where all of neuroscience is going. So what I'm going to try to do in this talk is give you a narrative to sort of understand where the future lies. And what I want to say is all of this has been enabled by the fact that we have been using exponential technologies basically to hack the neural code. So essentially, the nervous system is comprised of a number of cells which use chemicals and electricity to communicate. And they communicate in this amazing symphony. And in the old days, we used, to, we used to just listen. We would impale these cells with either a metal or a glass electrode and listen to them cell by cell. Now exponential technologies have allowed robots to start doing this. But it's in the process of actually doing this that we've been able to put together these things and actually create links to the synthetic biology that we are actually approaching. So what you see here is an animation with a glass pipette that's coming through. It's injecting both fluid and current as it pushes all this nervous system tissue out of the way, and it uses it to figure out when it's actually approaching the neuron. And once it does, it actually makes a physical connection by poking a hole in the neuron. And now what you have is a salt bridge, a salt bridge which can be amplified, and those electrical signals can be actually passed to something that can interpret them. So this is what was required to get to where we are going now. So what can we do with these amazing technologies? <clears throat> Well, right now, we typically don't impale human brains with glass electrodes. We don't do that on a regular basis. But what we have developed is the technology to actually start listening to the brain. And this is a very spectacular example of that. So using a very, very old technology, fMRI, a group over in Berkeley was able to actually use machine learning to try and understand what the brain was saying in the back of the cortex. So what happened was they took a bunch of volunteers, stuck them into a scanner, and played a bunch of videos for them. And then what they did was they actually measured the signals coming from the back of their brain and tried to create a data dictionary for every sound, light, everything that passed through there. They actually tried to create some sort of a correlation. And then they passed a new set of subjects through, and they tried to actually reconstruct and predict what they were seeing. And you see the result on the screen in front of you. So the presented clip is on your left, and the reconstruction using a machine learning algorithm and fMRI is on the right. We can now look into the brain and actually see what it is you are seeing. All right, so imagine where this technology is taking us, OK? So we can now read brains without opening them. So not to be outdone, there was a Japanese group a few years later that said, huh, could we actually use a similar technology to read people's dreams? And what they did was they combined EEG and fMRI, and every time a subject was about to fall asleep and enter that state where they began to visually hallucinate, they actually did the same thing. They created a data dictionary using fMRI, and they actually created this sort of dream catcher and reconstructed in very broad brush strokes the landscape of what they were seeing. So, we have now taken these kinds of technologies and used them for all sorts of things. And one of the things that we do non-invasively with brains is actually measure how conscious they are. This is a very old technology. It's based on the brain actually metabolizing things. And what you can see is patients that have had cardiac arrest or that are in comas have very little activity going on in their brains. But in fact, we can use that same EEG technology in the operating room, which is my arena where I work. And every single one of my patients gets one of these devices, and I can actually track their level of consciousness so that my patients will not wake up when the surgeon is cutting into them. Because in fact, you can, using non-invasive technology, track depth of consciousness. And it turns out there's quite a bit of heterogeneity. Neural signals don't look the same from patient to patient. So although I can't talk about this here very much, if any of you are working across omics platform technology and want a partner, please come find me afterwards. So this technology has also been applied to patients who are comatose. Okay? So I told you we can use non-invasive imaging to assess states of consciousness. So this is a study that was done by Adrian Owen's group in Cambridge. And what they did was they actually asked a number of healthy subjects when they were in a magnet, imagine moving through your house, and they mapped what that space looked like. Imagine playing tennis, and they mapped what that looked like. And then they took a number of patients which were supposed to be in a coma or in a vegetative state, put them in the scanner, and most of them didn't light up. But one patient did. It was her. She lit up. Now, this is not the kind of patient, even though she can't respond to you verbally, that you want to be pulling the plug on. 
right? Suppose this patient had locked-in syndrome. She's actually, through a lot of neuro rehab, recovered quite a bit now, and she's out in the real world again. But we can actually use non-invasive imaging to assess states of consciousness. And this has actually been brought out even into the medical legal arena using same, the same sort of technology, average spatial patterns of activation in the brain people are now trying to use fMRI as a human lie detector. All right, so what you do is you take a number of subjects and you say to them, you ask them a number of questions and you have them tell the truth, and then you ask them a number of questions and you have them deliberately lie. You average the signal, so here green is telling the truth, red is lying. And then you can actually get patterns of activation that may represent truth telling or lying. The problem is, They've tried to admit this in courts of law, but would you actually, number one, want your brain to be used against you and testifying against yourself? And the second thing to bear in mind is that diseased brains or perhaps psychopathic brains may not light up with the exact same patterns. So this becomes a, very much a big data problem. So we're talking about reading the brain, but that entire process of reading the brain has enabled us to start rewiring it. And neurosurgery has actually done this for quite a while. Deep brain stimulation, many of you may have either gone through it yourself or have loved ones who have, is actually something that we use to treat a lot of movement disorders, and it's even been found to treat things like Alzheimer's, depression, etc. But the problem is, when you take an electrode and you put it into the brain and you generate an electrical field, what you do is you create a lot of side effects because everything that is within the field of stimulation of that electric field is going to become affected. And sometimes it's not the neurons that you want to rewire. So what we need are more selective technologies. Now, this technology, optogenetics, is one such technology. It's actually been accelerated by two amazing personalities, Carl Dysaroth at Stanford and Ed Boyden at MIT. And what we do here, this is like gene therapy for your brain, we take viruses, and then we package the DNA sequences for proteins that actually respond to light. And once you infect the brain with these viruses, they express in the channels of these neurons, respond to pulses of light, and now you can selectively open and close channels or basically activate or silence the brain at will. And here's an example, actually, in a mouse model of Parkinson's. This is basically this particular protein that was expressed in one side of the brain, in the motor cortex that's responsible for movement. And what you'll see is this particular protein likes to respond to blue light. And when the blue light comes on, this animal turns in a circle. And it's reversible. So when the light goes off, the animal will just simply stop. So one of the problems we have is that it is really difficult to get things into the brain. So one question is, how can we get these selective technologies from the periphery here? And for a long time, it was thought you would have to do brain surgery to actually infect the brain. But very recently, a group at Caltech sequentially took, down that, took that virus and broke down the coat over and over and over again, and kept injecting it into the peripheral bloodstream. And they finally found one example where the virus was actually transported across the blood-brain barrier and lit up in the brain. We now have a mechanism to peripherally inject viruses and have them actually deliver whatever it is we want into the brain, and that was never possible before. Now, we could do things invasively, but a lot of groups are trying to do things non-invasively, so you don't have to implant electrodes, fiber optics, into a brain permanently. So you can use magnetic stimulation, electrical stimulation, but in fact, there is a group that took that same idea. Let's take a virus and infect the brain, but instead of packaging the sequence in for a light-sensitive channel, they used a pressure-sensitive channel, one that actually responds to touch, very similar to what you have on your fingertips. And now what they could do was actually inject focused sound waves. So this is actually a movie of such a virus that's actually injected into a motor neuron in a worm brain, and what you'll actually see is when the ultrasound pulse hits the neuron, the worm will change direction. Okay, so we now have seen examples of genetically controlled light-sensitive robotic mice, 
genetically controlled, sound-sensitive robotic worms, okay? So this has opened up an entire new domain for neurotherapeutics. And moving on with this theme, actually, of non-invasive manipulation, reading and writing of the brain, a group at Berkeley has developed this thing called Neural Dust. I think there was another presenter who had a slide on this. But essentially, this is a very tiny piezoelectric device. They're actually trying to miniaturize this to be about the size of grains of sand. And the idea is that you can sprinkle this through the cortex, you can actually place this on peripheral nerves, and that's what you see down there, is a rat peripheral nerve. And you can now use this to interact with the environment using sound waves and both read what the brain is doing, the signals coming from the brain, and actually direct the brain to control parts of the body. So the goal is now to get from here to the world of prosthetics. Now, we were very, very fortunate last year to have as one of our keynote speakers, Lee Hochberg, who's part of the BrainGate 2 consortium. What you see here, and this was sort of his his sort of child, that is an array. So that's a number of these tiny, tiny little metal electrodes and what happens with it is that array is implanted into the brains of people who are quadriplegic. So they cannot move their arms or legs. It is implanted into this area called premotor cortex, which can actually receive information coming from the part of your brain that plans to move. And then it's translated into actuators outside in order to do things. So you can basically use your thoughts to control the external world. And what you see here is a quadriplegic patient who is using his thoughts to direct a mouse to open his email, read it, and type back messages to people. All right, so that is completely changing the landscape of prosthetics. This quadriplegic woman is actually using her thoughts to control a robotic arm to bring a bottle of water to her. So imagine how freeing this is to people with disabilities. And you'll see that this is just life-changing technology for these people. Now, there are actually very simple ways to begin to access this system. Not everybody is a candidate for having their skull cracked open and having a chip put on top of it. That comes with some problems. So the idea is, could we actually non-invasively read your brains and direct something in the external world to happen? And in fact, what you see here, there's a number of groups doing this, but here's a guy who is using a simple band, which is actually just measuring some very, very basic electrical signals coming from his head, and he's driving a wheelchair using his thoughts. All of you could go out there and actually buy a consumer EEG wearable device, buy a chip off Amazon, and actually program something to do something very similar. There's a lot of open source data that could help you with this sort of thing. And there are a number of groups around the world that are working to do this for people with disabilities, people who have actually prosthetic limbs, to be able to direct them. Now, this is one of the most amazing examples. This is basically work that's been done by Miguel Nicolelis's group. They're over at Duke University, and they have something called the Walk Again Project. What you see on this person, he's paraplegic, not quadriplegic, so he's lost use of his legs, and he's wearing a non-invasive EEG cap. He's sort of hung suspended, and what he's doing is he's wearing actually a bionic exoskeleton. And he's imagining the process of walking. And that exoskeleton is actually translating his thoughts into moving the skeleton forward. And at the same time, that skeleton, in conjunction with AR and VR, is giving him feedback. And you can see that one of these paraplegics actually made the first kick at the 2014 FIFA World Cup. All right, so this is actually where human bionics is going. We are becoming synthetic. We are able to now integrate with electronics and stuff in silico in order to advance human therapeutics, all because we've cracked the neural code. And what's really special about this, and this was unexpected, when they actually looked at these patients long-term afterwards, the ones who'd been interacting with these exoskeletons, many of them recovered neurological function, people with spinal cord injuries. So that was an unexpected result of the plasticity that came from actually revving up the nervous system this way. This is an amazing example. This is called sensory substitution. What you have here is a device that's a set of glasses with a camera on it. And you can see over there, there's something that almost looks like a lollipop. And what it does is it translates pictures from a camera into basically a set of electrical stimuli in the exact same shape. And you put it on your tongue, 
and you can actually taste the world in grayscale. And what that looks like is this. Your brain is what really sees, not your eyes. If your eyes don't work, and you can create another portal into the brain, then your brain is what is going to interpret the world around you. Brainport is essentially a camera that translates a video image to a plate that I wear in my mouth. Dad. Hundreds of pixels on the plate tingle on my tongue, and together they form patterns and shapes that my brain interprets as the space around me. The information's the same whether you collect it from your eyes or from our cameras with a tongue display. He knows a lot about his environment already through the sense of sound and touch, and this adds one more piece to the puzzle. I can see it, I just can't grab it. He's climbing a rock wall blind, using a device, and sensing his environment through the sense of taste. Tasting his way up a rock wall. So, you can see with exponential technologies, we're going to be miniaturizing that camera, it's and soon, different. it's going to be implantable, right? I have another friend I went to grad school with, Dave Eagleman. He's developed a vest that does sensory substitution. So for people who can't hear, the vest vibrates so that they can actually transmit signals into their brain and substitute. So this is sensory substitution. Finally, we're here at an exponential conference. How many people here would like to cryogenically preserve themselves and perhaps live forever. Yeah, there's people, okay. All right, so what happens if you are cognitively impaired? Would any of you want to do that as your brain function declines? And what if we were to freeze you, cryogenically preserve you, and your brain stopped working well? So we have some friends in the animal kingdom that can still regenerate as adults. Salamanders, starfish, you cut off a limb and they regrow. This is the real salamander limb. So there is a group that has now set out using a combination of things like electrical stimulation of peripheral nerves, scaffolding stem cells, and they've set out to see if they can actually wake up brain-dead people. All right, so this company actually got an IRB to do this at a hospital in India. They are now registered in clinicaltrials.gov. And let's look out for them, because if you are actually going to preserve your life, you want to preserve your brain, your cognitive function. And with that, I will end. Thank you. <laughs>